All right. Um, like I said, one of the great powers of Docs is the ability to share. You know, to, to to share with other colleagues, to share with students, to give them view rights, edit rights, to collaborate, to comment, to work together, to connect with people that aren't even you know physically in your building, to share and collaborate around the world. You know, so much can come from that that we can't normally do in education. Um, and so, what I want to talk about are some ideas for how this can occur. Now, as always, all this information is on the Apps User Group site. So if you go to the presentation page for this one, you'll see that I have the presentation right here. So that's the, the link to the, uh, to the multimedia presentation you're watching. But here's a link to the handout that goes along with it. This is, again, one of those things where in the next 50 minutes or so as I talk about this, I'm going to share a lot of information, and you may not be able to, you know, catch it all. Don't worry about that. It's all here, okay? Everything's in this handout. I go step by step by step talking about everything we're going to discuss. I got pictures. I got, you know, one, two, three, A, B, C. Every single thing that we mention is in this document, and so you can refer back to that later. It's a Pretty good size, one about 13 pages long. So lots and lots of info there. Please refer back to that. It's freely available right there on the Apps User Group site for this presentation. All right. All right, well, we'll skip over who I am, and we will get right into this. All right, so the overview. Um, there's a lot of ways to go paperless with Google Docs. Okay, so this is not a session about here's how you do it. It's not like this is, here's the secret. This is what you do. One, two, three, A, B, C. No, there's a lot of tools that allow you to go paperless, to move from a traditional paper pencil class into one that is more digital. And so really, what I want to do in this session is show you 10 ideas, 10 tools for going paperless. Maybe some of them make sense and work for you. Maybe others, eh, not really. You know, that doesn't apply. That's okay. Just be aware of these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas of how you could start moving more into a digital interactive uh, environment for your teaching. All right. These are the 10. <laughs> we'll go through each of them, so don't worry about them. We'll hit each one of those. Some are really basic. Some are really common sense. You're like, why are you even telling us that? Well, it's important, you know, to pause and think about some of these. Others are a lot more complicated and will have a lot more steps. All right, so the very first one is probably one of the really basic ones, but it's important. Naming things, all right? If you're going to start sharing stuff, it's no problem when you share one document with one person. But what if you want to do this with all your kids? Maybe you're a middle school, high school teacher. You've got 125 students you know, th this semester. Well, if they start sharing documents with you, and every time they share one, you get another 125 documents from each kid, and they do this once a week, twice a week, three times a week, oh my gosh, suddenly you're going to have hundreds of documents getting shared with you. Well, I'm hoping as we talk about this today, I'll show you how to not lose your mind with that, how to, how to organize that. But one of the first key steps is naming things. If everyone's called a research paper, Oh, boy, <laughs> you're going to be in some trouble there because whose is whose and what's what. So what I encourage is to come up with some kind of naming convention. It doesn't matter what it is. You, you pick it, you know, if it's for your school, for your grade level, for you. But I would suggest something probably like use the school year somewhere in the name, you know, 2012, you know, for this, for this upcoming school year, for example. Probably include the class period in there somewhere. Probably include your name or the student's name, whoever's document it is, and probably include the name of what the thing is, what the document itself, itself is. For example, a research paper could be named 2011-07-Smith-John-Research Paper. There will be no confusion about that two months from now when John Smith looks at his own Google Docs. He'll go, oh yeah, that's the paper I wrote for my period seven class. And you'll have no confusion two months from now when you know, yep, that's John Smith's paper he wrote for me. Okay, that I think is really helpful. Now, how do you do that? How do you name things? Well, let me go ahead and pull up my docs here again for you. If you create a new document, which I think earlier today I made this untitled document, nothing really in it, just blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if you make a document, you can name a document by simply clicking in the top left-hand corner. It'll start out untitled, and that's it. You just go in and type in. 2012, uh, period 8, 
uh, Mr. Kurtz, and we'll say study guide chapter two. Okay, there we go. I've named it. Now that document has a name. I could name it also in my Google Drive, my Google Docs screen there. I could have just taken my mouse, right clicked on it, and said rename. That's fine too. Okay. Same thing for folders, which we'll get to a little bit later. I could take any folder, right click on a folder, and rename that just as well. So you can name files and folders very easily in the document or in your full drive screen there. Okay. All right, so very simple, first idea. Second thing to be aware of when it comes to going paperless are the different options for sharing. Edit rights, comment rights, and view rights. And we'll get into these in a lot more detail, but I want to make sure you're aware that they all exist and what people can do with them. So let's go back to this very exciting document that I have here, my study guide. And let's say I want to share this. Well, I'm going to use the big blue share button, but we'll cover that in more detail here in just a moment. But I just want you to be aware, if I were to go and share this with my test student, you will see that I have three options down there. Eh, let me see if I can zoom in so you can see that better. Do, 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 do. Okay, scroll over here. Uh, I won't be able to zoom in far enough for you to see that there. We'll go back to normal. That's okay. But right down here in the bottom corner, you see there's can edit can comment and can view. If you give somebody edit rights, they can make any change they want to to the document. Okay? They can delete things, they can add new things, they can edit it. I mean, that's really what editing is all about. Now, before that frightens you too much, be aware that Google keeps track of every change that happens to a document. So if somebody was malicious, if you gave them edit rights and they decided, I'm going to go in and delete all their stuff you can go into the revision history and revert it back to an earlier version. And we'll look at the revision history just a little bit later here. We'll take a look at how that works. So you can undo what they've done. Now, editing means they can add, change, delete the contents of the file. They can't actually delete the file. Okay? You're not giving them ownership of it. You're just letting them have edit rights. So they can't actually delete the file. They can at most delete what's in it, which you can then revert back if you really needed to. Hasn't turned out to be a real big issue for us. We have not had students abusing that. They, they seem to work well in, you know, when they're doing the group work because they realize it tracks everything. <laughs> you know, if you do something, well, we can tell who did it. You know? So it's important for them to realize that. So that's what edit is about. Now, can comment. That's where they can't change the document, but they can put those marginal notes in the right-hand side. So if I choose can comment, like I did this comment earlier here in the margin, they can add those, which is great for peer review and stuff like that, to be able to leave feedback on a document without actually changing the document itself. And then finally, can view is, as you'd expect, you can just view the document. You can't change it at all, but you can make a copy of it. Please be aware of that, okay? If you give somebody view rights to a document, they can, I'll just cancel out of this for right now, we'll look at that in a second, they can go file, make a copy, okay? And they can get their own copy of it. And that's okay, that's not like a bad thing, but just be aware that it exists. Um, you would probably use that if you wanted to give a study guide out where you put in the questions and then blanks underneath them, and then you share the study guide out to the kids in view only mode. If you share it out editing, then you've got 125 kids trying to edit the same document. That's not what you mean to do. You want them each to have their own study guide, right? So you make the study guide with the questions and the blanks. You share it view only. What do they do? They click file, make a copy. They get their own copy. Now that's their copy. They own that copy. They can edit that one and turn it back into you later, okay? But yes, they can make a copy of anything that you make viewable, okay? So those are the three levels of sharing rights. Edit, comment, and view. All right, step three, or item three, sharing with specific people. Okay, so now we're ready to actually share a document. So how do you share? And this is true for presentations. It's true for spreadsheets. It's true for sites. All of these things, okay? It works the same in all of them. It's true for calendars. You can share calendars, okay? Um, Here's the idea. Here's how it basically works. If you want to share with people, 
you can use the big blue share button and you can either share with specific people which is step three here or item four you can share it as a link with non-specific people and I'll explain the difference between the two okay in both cases though this is really more for what I'm calling a one-shot deal or a unique sharing need I would not do this if I'm going to be sharing with the same person, same group of people all year long, I wouldn't keep doing the blue share button. I'll show you a different option for repeated sharing. If I just need to share this document with this unique group of people right now, the big blue share button is your friend. So how's that work? Well, basically what you do is you click the big blue share button and it opens up the sharing settings window. There are two different places here that you can change things. One is at the bottom where it says add people. The second's at the top where it says who can access private and there's a change link. These are the two different things I was talking about. One is for sharing with specific people. One is sharing for with non-specific people. Now, let me explain what I mean. Let's say I know who I want to share this with. I need to share this with this specific student. Well, I come here and I type in his name, test student, and there he is. Okay, He pops up out of my address book. I could now share this document specifically with test student. It will now be available to him. He'll get an email saying this document has been shared to you. Even if you're not using Gmail, the email will go through to your Exchange server. It'll say this has been, this has been shared with you, and it will be available in his Google Docs. I could share it with a whole list of people. Okay, I could say, do you remember I was talking about our distribution lists? Um, like we've got Stu Dash for like our students, like Stu Dash 08. That's like all the 8th grade students. I could share this document out with every 8th grade student if I wanted to. Or with our staff. That's like list dash. List dash, um, you know, MS, all the middle school math teachers, MS math or something like that. Well, I'm not really going to do that. They would wonder why they just got this document sent to them. Uh, but the idea is I'm sharing with people I specifically can identify, either by their email or by the group they're in. If you can say who you're sharing it with, then there you go. You can click add a message and say here is the whoops, the study guide for chapter oh geez, chapter one. Good thing it's not for spelling. Uh, for chapter one, uh, make a copy and fill this out. Okay. And if I hit share and save, st test student is going to get that email and a link to that document. So Poof, there it goes. Test student now has it. Excellent. A digital copy. You're making another digital copy of that document. But when you make a copy, that copy is something you own so you can edit that copy. Hmm? Now I can change this later. I can say, uh, I didn't mean to give the test student edit rights. He just needs to view it. <laughs> I didn't mean he could edit it. Uh, I'm going to go and make him can view instead. Or I'm going to make him can comment instead. Ah, yeah, I've already sent it. You can change it any time. Exactly. Or I can hit the X button and take him out entirely. Now that student doesn't even have access to it. So I can hit save changes, and now test student can only comment on it. They can make a copy, they can comment, they can't edit it. So you've got total control. You have total control over who has access to your documents. I could add another person. Add a different student. There's my daughter's account. She's graduated now, but I kept her account on because I need something to play with. <laughs> and so I could add her in there so she can edit it, but the other kid can comment. You can do whatever you want. Okay? So that is an example of sharing with a specific person or group of people if you know who they are. But you know what? You don't always know who they are, do you? What if you want to share this with your parents? Well, maybe you don't have all their email addresses or you want to just share it with who you know you want to put it on your web page and whoever comes across it you want them to be able to access it well I don't know who that's gonna be so item four sharing a document as a link okay so this is good if you want it to be available to an unspecified group of people how's that work very similar you again click the blue share button that takes you into the regular sharing screen but instead of messing with the bottom here, you come up here where it says who has access and next to your privacy settings, you hit the change link. And that brings up this screen where now you can say, okay, 
This is a totally private document or it is available to anybody at North Canton City Schools who I give the link to or it's available to anybody in my school district at all, even without the link. They can search for it. They could go to Google Docs, type in a few keywords. They could find the document, okay? They could search for it and get to it. Or it's public on the web if you have the link. Anybody anywhere in the world, outside of my school district, whatever, if they have the link, they can get to it. Or it's completely public on the web even without the link, meaning they could Google search and find my document if they typed in the right words, okay? And then I can give them below, can edit, can comment, or can view. I can make it publicly accessible on the web for people to view. I could make it available to North Canton schools and let them edit it. I could give all sorts of different things. I'll just make it public on the web for right now. So I'll say it's public on the web and people can just view it. Um, and I'll hit save and look what it does. It gives me the magic link. So here's that crazy long link just like you did with forms, remember that. So I can come here and I can copy this crazy long link and now, just like before, I just need to make that available. However, put it on your website, you know. Hey, parents, here's my, here's my newsletter. Click this link to read it. So they, you put the link on the website, they click the link, boom, it opens up the document. Because you shared it publicly, anybody can view it, okay? Or you um, do what we said earlier about the art showcase. The kids type up a Google Doc explaining what the painting is about and why they painted it and what it means and all this and you make a QR code that links to that crazy link you put the QR code underneath it parents come put it on their phone the document opens up and they read all about the creation of this art piece or whatever the case might be so you just then have to get that link out to people so that's the idea all right there are many and I, I don't have one to recommend if you simply go and just Google QR code. There's so many of them, yes. I can pull it up here if you want me to. You said B, like just the letter B. Oh, ha, ha. Be curious. There you go. So, uh, so there you go. So there's another one. There are so, if you just type in QR code, quick response code. Okay, if you just type in QR code in Google, you'll find tons of them. They're free. I'm sure there's some paid ones out there, but they're most all free. You paste the link in, it generates the code for you. You, you save, I don't know. Okay. 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 Thanks for the suggestion of that one. I'm always looking for new ideas. So yes, so that's, that's an idea if you want to share a document sort of as a one-shot deal, okay? Now, where this becomes a problem is if you're going to be sharing with the same group of people for a long period of time, this will work, but you're going to get a lot of documents showing up in your Google Docs. You're going to get a lot of emails every time the kids share stuff. You get 125 emails. You know, oh, all these kids shared this stuff with me. And your Google Docs will have 125 messages in there, 125 docs in there. Well, if you're going to be doing this a lot, you need to use folders. Okay? And so that's the next thing we're going to transition into, is talking about folders. Now, it's what you'd expect. It's a folders where you put documents in. The big difference between, like, Microsoft Windows My Documents folders and Google Docs folders is it's a lot like email. You can put a file into more than one folder at a time. It's not making copies of it, it's just linking it to more than one folder. So I could have a presentation that I put into a folder called Minford Jackson Training. And that exact same presentation could be in a folder called Google Apps. And that same presentation could be in another folder called North Canton Training. And it's not copies of the file. It's the same presentation just linked to each one of them. If I make the change, it shows up in all of them as being changed because it is just one file. So be aware, you can put a file in multiple folders. Other than that, same idea of a folder pretty much works. So how do you do that? Well, let's look at it going two directions. First, as a staff member, 
sharing like handouts or study guides or things out to your students. Then let's turn in the other direction and talk about students having a turn-in folder that they're sharing things back to you. So we'll go both directions. We'll start with you making a handouts folder for the kids. How would that work? Well, here's what I would do. First of all, I would go to my Google Docs and I need to make a folder, a handouts folder. Well, I want to keep track of it so I don't lose my mind. So I would probably make a folder for the school year. So over here, underneath my drive, you'll see I've already done that. There's a folder called 2012. Well, if it wasn't there, I would just hit create folder and I could make one. Okay, well, I did this at a different training. So there it is, there's a 2012 folder. Well, let me open up 2012. And inside of there, I've made a folder called handouts and a folder called turn in. Okay, well, again, if I hadn't done that, I would just click here. Here's a nice little new folder button I could click and I could say, here's a new folder called handouts. Well, if I open up handouts, you'll see that I've got a folder called 2012-07 Mr. Kurtz's handouts. That's for my seventh period class. I need one for my eighth period class. So here I am inside my 2012 folder inside my handouts. And again, you don't have to organize in that way. That just makes sense to me. So that's, that's how I'm putting the folders together. But inside of handouts, I'm going to say, I want a period eight handouts folder. So I'll click new folder, 2012, period eight, Mr. Kurtz, whoops, try that again. Hand outs. There we go. And so now I've got inside of there, two folders. There's a period seven, and a period eight folder. So I, I make the folder, you gotta create it first. Okay, so there it is. What do I do then? I share the folder. So right click on it, go to share, and I share it out just like normal, okay? But I'm only sharing it once, see? Because now, once I share it, anything I drop in the folder automatically gets shared. I don't have to reshare over and over and over again. Share the folder once, drop things in it from then on, okay? So I come in and I share it with the student, whoops. So I share it with my test student. I would actually share it with my period eight, you know, so I put in the email addresses of my period eight kids or use my mailing group for my period eight kids. And I'm just gonna give them view rights. Why view? Well, because this is a handouts folder. I don't want them changing my handouts. These are there for them to read or make copies of, okay? This is my handouts folder. So there we go. Go ahead and hit share and save. At this point, test student is getting an email saying Mr. Kurtz has shared this with you, okay? Well, let's prove that that's really what happened. So let's go over to test student. Here's test student and let's refresh our email. Oh, there it is. Open up the email. Here it is, I've shared 2012-08 Mr. Kurtz handouts with you. They can open it, it's not gonna be too exciting, there's nothing in it. I just shared a folder, but there it is. Okay, I've shared that folder with them. So what could that student do? That test student could now go to his My Drive, or his, his drive screen, and he could look down, see obviously I, I need to clean up my, I teach this class a lot, <laughs> so there's a lot. Thankfully, I just keep making new periods, uh, but um, so it wouldn't look quite this crowded. Normally, I probably need to clean this up, but he could go to shared with me. He could find the period eight folder and he could drag that over to his my drive. So it shows up right in his list of stuff. And now anytime he goes to his my drive, he could go to his uh, the period eight, Mr. Kurtz handouts folder. And if I share something, it's going to be there. Really? Well, let's try. Okay. Let's see if that's really true. So I will go ahead and I will make a document and I will say 2012, oops, sorry about that. I'll say 2012, period eight, Mr. Kurtz. And we'll say this is a uh, study guide for a different chapter. We'll say this is for chapter three. And we'll just put in some stuff here. There we go. All right, so that's awesome. All right, so I've made this document and I haven't shared it with him. I just made it, but watch what I do. I grab it and I drag and drop it into my period eight handouts folder. There it is, it's in my period eight handouts folder. 
Go to test student. Open up 2012, period 8, Mr. Kurtz handouts, and there it is. It's in there. All right. So now he could open that up, view only, but he could hit file, and he could make a copy. The copy he would be able to edit and make changes to and turn it back into me or something if need be. Okay? Well, we'll actually do that. We'll go file, make a copy. Here's his copy of it. He'll rename it because it is now his study guide. And this will be Smith J. And there we go. So now there's his copy of the study guide. And he can go in, and now he could put in his info. And so now he's adding all of his stuff in there. All right? Now, that's going one direction. So that is me making a, a handout folder that I put things in for the students. Just do this once at the start of the year. They all get it. They all have it in their Google Drive, and you just use that to give stuff out to them. Go the other direction now. How about they want to make turn-in folders for you? Again, I would do this at the start of the year. Bring them down to the lab or something and say, okay, everybody, we're going to do this together to make sure we do it right, and then we're done. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay? Very similar. The student goes in, and they make a folder for you. Now it's up to them. I mean, you know, they can make subfolders and stuff. They could go in and they could they could create a folder for 2012 if they wanted to. And inside of there, they could create, you know, a folder for, you know, turn in because maybe they're going to have a bunch of them, one for each class period. That's up to them. They can or they don't have to do that. But I'm just saying they could. The point is they then need to make the folder they're going to use for turn in. It's just, you know, up to them if they want to kind of nest it inside of other organizational folders that make sense to them. Okay. So here I am, 2012, turn in, and the student's going to go and click on new folder, and they'll make one called 2012, period 8, Smith J, oops, and then um, turn in. Oh, there we go. I still got an extra character in there. There we go. So now there's the folder. And they should do that for all their classes. They should have one for period one, two, three, four for all their classes to turn things in. Um, they need to share that folder with you. So they go to here, they right click, they share, and they put your name in there. So there I am. And they need to give you edit rights. You're the teacher, you're allowed to request that or demand that. <laughs> yeah, you need edit rights because you need to be able to leave comments and correct things and put things in there. Yes, you, you need edit rights. And so you tell them, guys, put my name in there and give me edit rights. They hit save and share, and that gets sent to you. Now, you are going to get a bunch of these the first day because every single student's going to share these with you. So back in your drive, you're now going to be getting, we're well, going to be getting emails, a bunch of them, you know, every, every one. But in your shared with me part of your drive, there it is, 2012 08 Smith J turn in. You'll get 30 of these if you're an elementary teacher. You'll get 125 if you're a middle school or high school teacher. You'll get all of these shared with you. You now need to organize them one time. This is just a one time thing at the start of the year. So what do you do? You come up here to 2012 and you come here and you make a little folder called turn in underneath that. And inside of the turn in folder, you make one for period two, and you make one for period you know, three, and here's one for period eight. You make all of these subfolders for each period. And what do you do? You drag and drop all of the kids' folders into there so that it's organized. So I come here to share it with me. I go, okay, here's a period eighter. Let's put him in there. Boom. And you drag and drop them over. And then you open them up, and boom, there's all your period 8 kids, and boom, there's all your period 7 kids. They're organized. They're in one nice place. So what happens from here on out? Anytime Jay Smith wants to share something with me, no problem. He comes here, and he goes, okay, uh, here's his uh, study guide, remember, that he just made his copy of. He's ready to turn it back into me. Drag it, drop it into his turn-in folder. 
come back over to my screen, go to his turn in folder. There it is. There's his document. So it's been. Have to drag and drop one time. Um, good question. If they make changes later, right? There's no need to re. There's no need to put it back in the folder again. It's in the folder. So any changes they make to the document are live in that document. Now keep in mind. I said before, you can put it in more than one folder. It doesn't make sense in this example, but you can put a file into as many folders as you want. It's not making copies of the file. Remember, this is in the cloud. It's one document in J. Smith's folder, and now it's in my folder. It's in both of those folders, but it's the same document. If he makes changes to it, I'll see them. Watch. I'll open up. I'll open up Jay Smith's document. There it is. I'm looking at his document, and he's looking at his document. Okay? Look at this. One other viewer. He knows I'm looking at it. One other viewer. I know he's looking at it. I can type. Here's, uh, this is from Mr. Kurtz. Go to his screen. This is from Mr. Kurtz. He can type. This is from J. Or we'll say he's John Smith. We'll let him be John Smith. This is from John Smith. Go to my screen. This is from John Smith is there. It's live. I can't type fast enough to, so you can see it live. Uh, but And then I could chat with him over here. Hey, John. And he would see that from me. Hey, John. And he could write back, yes, Mr. Kurtz. And then I would see, yes, Mr. Kurtz. And so it's a live document that is shared between two people. It's in his folder and it's in my folder. Okay. We both can see it and we both can edit it live. Yes. Oh, okay. Or can, do you have, can you manage the sorting? Yeah, uh, there's not a lot of options for sorting, uh, but like you'll see here, it's like last edited by me, last modified, last opened by me, by the title, by the size, the quota, by how big it is. Not a lot of options, okay. but yeah. Now, I don't want to go into the deep end of the pool too far, but I will just let you know that yeah, if you want to put something in more than one folder, uh, you've got two options there. And again, don't worry about this. If you don't, if this, if you don't care about that, that's fine. I just want to let you know. If I wanted to put this somewhere else, if I drag and drop it again into like a different period, you see what it says? It says move 2012. Okay. If I just drag and drop, it means I want it to be in one folder. If I hold down my control key and drag and drop, it says add to the folder. That puts it in more than one place. The control key lets you do that. Or, if you don't like control keys, just right click and say you want to organize it. That's it. Open up organize and say, I want this to be in all these different folders. Whoops. I want it to be in there. And I want it to be in, whoops, sorry about that, uh, there, and I want it to be in there. I can check which folders I want it to be in. So if you're more of a, I'll just cancel, but if you're more of a clicker, clicking kind of person, you can right click and organize it. I'm more of a drag and dropper, so that's how I do that. So guys, the idea is students can create turn in folders, they can give you edit rights, whoops, share those with you. You can organize them nicely in subfolders. Every time they turn something into you, it just shows right up in those folders for you. And they don't have to reshare anything ever again. They know, drop it in the turn in folder, Mr. Kurtz gets it. I put it in the handouts folder, they can get to it. Okay? So that's an, if you're doing repeated sharing, I think that makes a lot more sense. Okay? Now, one more twist on that. One more twist on that. Point seven. So we're up to point seven now. Uh, even though, even though I think this is very good what we've shared so far, 
it can be a little better if you want it to be. You don't have to do this next step. You don't have to do any of these steps. But this is an add-on, OK? Instead of just doing the folder sharing, you can also say, how about this? I'm going to have some way that the kids tell me they've turned this in. So it's easier for me to know. And it's easier for me to track. Why? Well, because if they drop things in folders, I'm no longer getting emails saying, this has been turned in. This has been turned in. It's just in the folder. So hmm, do I have to click every folder to go through and find it? Well, yeah. I mean, you, you could and say it's, it's, it's the due date. So let me click down through the folders. Or use Google Forms to help you. OK? So here's the idea. You can make a Google Form that allows them to say, I'm, I just turned something in. And they still have to do all the normal stuff. they got to make the document. they got to drop it in the folder. Then they go to the Google Form and they say, I've turned in this, and here's the link to it to make it even easier for you. Let them do all the heavy lifting, okay? Make it easy for you, okay? So how does that work? Let me show you an example. What you could do is a form like, uh, like this. Okay. Let me unhide my rows so you can see what I've got here. All right. Here's the live form. So you make a form like this, 2012, period one, Kurtz assignment turn in form. I know it's period one. We're doing period eight, but that's okay. We'll just use this as an example. Say, so give me your last name. Give me your first name. Pick the assignment you're turning in. That's just a drop down list in Google Forms. You can change that anytime. I'm accepting these three assignments right now. This one's no longer accepted. Take it out of the form, put another one in. Okay, you can edit the form anytime you want. But you go ahead and put in what, what they're turning in. And then, what is the link to it? Remember, if the kid's sharing it with you, you have access to it. But why not make it easier for you? Instead of you even going to their folder, have them just give you the link right to it. So watch. Here's what you do. You make the form, and you share that link out to the kids, however. So just like we've been talking about the whole time, whatever method you do, you put the link in an email and give it to them at the start of the year. You uh, put it on your class website. Here's the turn in link anytime you turn something in. Okay, you give them that link at the start of the year. The kids go, they just know anytime they need to turn something in, they go there. And they say, okay, my last name is Smith, my first name is John, I'm turning in my uh, research paper, and what's my link? Well, the link is just, it's just the URL, it's just this. As long as they've shared it with you, as long as they threw it in the folder, you can access it. But let's make it easier on you. Tell the kids, just go up and copy the link and paste it in. And they hit submit. Now, why? They're now telling me I'm done. I, I've officially submitted this, this thing to you. That doesn't mean they can't make changes later or whatever. That's fine. But they're letting me know it's ready to be graded. I am turning. I have shared it. It's been turned in. How's this help me? Well, watch what happens on my end. I now have this spreadsheet that's collecting all that. And what do I see? I see the time and date it was submitted. So I know that they got it in at a certain time and date. I've got their name. I've got what thing was submitted. And I've got a link right to it. OK, now I'll close out of it because I've already got it open here. Close out of a few things here. Sorry about that. All right, so I'm pretending that I'm grading these assignments. What do I do? I come here and I go, OK, it looks like John Smith turned in his research paper and there's a link to it. I click the link and choo, I go straight out to it. I don't even have to go through the folders now. I can just click the link he gave me and get right to it. And I can go, OK, well, that looks good. Uh, let me you know, read through it and I'll go back and give him a grade now. So what do I do? I come back here. And what about these columns? These aren't part of the form. Well, that's the cool thing, guys. This is just a spreadsheet. A form just feeds into a spreadsheet. I can type anything I want over here. I just don't want to mess with the gray part over here where the form's coming in. I can make a grade column. I can make a done column. I can make a notes column. Anything I want, that's just for me. So I can say, ah, oh, he got a B plus on that. And so I can tell myself that I've already graded it. And that way I know I'm done with that one. Move on down the list. And so it's an easy way to let all the assignments come to one spreadsheet with links that I can click on and just grade them, boom, 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 right down the line. Maybe a column that says done, 
Put an X to say it's done. Maybe a notes column, blah, 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 tell myself something. Eh, it's up to me. You could put anything you want there, but the point is you're going to want something over there to tell yourself, yeah, I already did that one. That kind of lets you check it off, okay? Well, what else can you do that's kind of nice? Well, because you had them pick the name of the thing they were turning in, you can filter by those. Now, if you told them to type in the name of the project, they'd all type something different. Okay, nobody would spell it the same, they'd all type different. But because you had them pick it out of a list, I can come up here, turn on filtering with the little filter button, and I can say, show me only the research papers. Boom. And now I can grade all my research papers at once. Show me only the Lab 15 papers, or Lab 15 documents, or whatever they were. It's working. Come on. Choo, 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 choo. I think the hamster's getting tired. Now, can you just then link the grades to your gradebook? Can you link them? No, I mean, you, you'd, you, you, would, you would have to still type them in your gradebook. No, there's no communication between a spreadsheet and progress book or, or, or pre pinnacle or whatever. But it's more a matter of a place for you to tell yourself, yes, I graded this. This is what I gave. No, you'd still need to put that in. So I could filter it by that. I could filter it by the student. And then later on, if I'm done with a bunch of them, I could either highlight them, right click, and delete the rows, or just hide the rows. I could say, just hide those rows. I don't need them anymore. Boom, fold them up out of the way. So it's a great way for you to be able to have all the work come right to you, where you can filter, you can track, you can open the documents, and you can record what you've done. Okay, so that's just another twist. You do not have to use that, certainly, but I think there's some merit to doing that to manage all of these documents as they come in. All right, so that's point seven, and all the directions are there and on in the handout. All right, point eight for paperless, using templates. Um, that's kind of what you do when you make something view only. It's kind of like a template, right? You're giving them a view only document. They can make a copy. It's kind of like a template, but it's not really a template. There is something in Google Docs that's actually called templates, okay? There are real templates. And let me show you how that works. This can be really helpful to give kids a starting point to get going on something. So let's say I go back to my Google Docs screen and I go create from template. So I'm not going to create a new doc presentation spreadsheet form from scratch. I'm going to create from template. What that does is it opens up a screen where it shows you all of the templates for your school district, plus it allows you to look at publicly accessible templates as well. Okay? And it's coming. I don't know. Our internet may have thought the session was over earlier. Here it is. Okay. So this is the North Canton City Schools templates. And we've got bunches of them we put in there. Here's the book talk presentation I showed you earlier for our students. Here's one on a Planet Earth project they did. Here's that one I said where the AP Psych kids uh, were doing a, um, a brochure. And the teacher went ahead and made a template that already had the columns for how they wanted the brochure to look. And the kids could just go in and use that template, okay? Uh, let me go back. Or here's again the uh, book talk one. They could preview it and see, oh, okay, that's what the template's going to be. They could use that template or not. You can also go in and browse the public templates, which there's thousands and thousands and thousands. You could type in search terms, and you can find things to get you started. Templates are nice because anybody can get to them. Rather than just sharing it as a view-only document with these specific kids, I could put a template for the whole school. Maybe you've got a template that you want all the kids in the grade level to use, or a certain format that everybody you know, in math should be using. You can put that in the template gallery, and it can help younger students who need some help getting started, or any student, just to save them some time and get them onto the content, rather than having them recreate the thing from scratch. So templates, easy to create. All you do is make your document, go to the template gallery, and in the top right-hand corner, you see a link that says Submit a Template. And that's it. You go there, and you can pick anything out of your, your, out of your Google Docs, and you can add that into the template gallery for other people to access. Okay? All right. Um, 
Number nine, using comments. I know we already talked about this a bit, but let's officially take a look at it. Uh, remember how we talked about how you could add comments in. So if I were to come here to uh, Smith J's study guide, I could come in and I could go, okay, uh, he put in blah, 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 blah. I could highlight something that he had, had typed in, and I could insert a comment. Oh, not a footnote. I just put a footnote in, sorry. I could insert a comment, and over there I could say, uh, you know, please check spelling or something like that, okay? So I could, I could put a comment in there for him. Now, Smith J., when he goes to look at this document, he'll see this highlighted, and he'll see that I put in, please check spelling. He could click here, and he could reply to me and say, okay, it is fixed. And he could reply back to me. And we could have a conversation back and forth in the margin here. If I go to print this, those comments won't show up. This highlighting won't show up. That's just for us to communicate. It doesn't actually change the document itself. This is where peer editing or peer review could happen, where students leave comments for each other. I could edit or delete comments or resolve it. If we got it fixed, click the resolve button, boom, folds away that comment, puts it away. Okay, So we don't have to see it anymore. But commenting is another great way to have that communication that normally maybe you'd be writing it on the paper. Let's say you're just grading it. Maybe you're not wanting feedback. Maybe all I'm doing is putting a grade on this. No problem. I could just uh, come here and go insert comment. And I could say grade equals B plus. And I could say good job. And Oh, I was the student, sorry. I meant to be me, <laughs> sorry. I forgot who I was. Sometimes I forget who I am. <laughs> so I could go back to being me, <laughs> and I could insert a comment, and I could put in <laughs> the grade equals a B plus, and I could say good job. All right, that's much better. Um, and so, oops, B plus. And there we go. And so maybe that's all it is. Maybe the comment is just me putting in the grade for the assignment, instead of having a piece of paper that I sit and I write the grades on and give back, I just put it in the comment for the kid. And they have it back that way. So comments are another good way to go paperless. And number 10, the last thing to hit on real quick here is revision history. Everything that changes in a document or in you know your presentations, that's all recorded. Google keeps track of it. And that can be very helpful for a number of reasons. If you were doing a research or a term paper and you used to get a rough draft and then a second version and then a final version, you'd have three separate papers you could look at to see what changes. Not with a Google Doc. There's only one file. This is it. So if they change things, how do you know what they changed? How do you compare it? Well, you can use revision history. If I go back to this document with me and Smith J, I can go file and I can say see revision history. That brings up this sidebar over here where I can go back and say, okay, what did it look like you know, earlier? Ah, and what did it look like earlier? Oh, and what did it look like earlier? Oh, that's what it looked like. And I can keep going back and seeing what it looks like at different points in time. And it will color code it. Green, in this case, is student 0000. That's what he changed. Here, I'm pink and he's green. So I did that and he did that. And I can see exactly who did what. Now this is nice because it allows me to see, did the student make the change I asked? That can be useful. But it's also great for group work. I can see who did what, which person made what change, what amount of work did they put into that. So the revision history can be very helpful for you, either for grading, uh, for dividing up a grade among a group, or for just seeing has the, the student made the changes I asked them to make. It's also a good way to catch plagiarism. Um, when somebody plagiarizes, they usually just copy and paste things, which means it goes from nothing on the page to this much stuff on the page. <laughs> and so you can see very quickly in the revision history that out of nowhere, five paragraphs showed up. Because you can even go to more detailed and see it like, you know, by the, you know, the, the minute you can just get down to there. So if suddenly a bunch shows up, chances are it was copied and pasted in. You know? So that's helpful too. Uh, this is not from our district, but I did see it online uh, about, about revision history. Uh, there were some students who were doing a group project 
And uh, one of the students was complaining about the grade they got. They thought it was lower than it should have been. And so one of the team leaders of their group, one of the students, wrote to them and said, um, we looked at the Google Docs revision history, and we see that in our document we worked on, here's everything you did. You changed the word combined to in combination, and you removed the words this makes. Uh, out of all the words in here, that is 0.55, not 55%, 0.55% of all the work that was done. <laughs> I think you should be glad of the grades you got. <laughs> and so it helped re resolve group issues as well on there. All right. So, um, so those are the 10 biggies that I think are very useful if you're going to start moving into the whole Google Docs realm. If you want to start sharing, if you want to start collaborating, if you want to start getting people doing group work, be aware at least of these tools to make your job easier as you make the transition from a tr traditional classroom into one that's more cloud-based, more collaborative, and so forth. Any questions on that or any of that? Yes? Equity issues about kids having access to the internet. We don't have a real big problem with that. Um, we've got pretty good access at home, but you need to consider that. That was back on the very beginning today when we talked about challenges. We talked about connectivity, having access. Well, you need to think about that. So, you know, is it going to be maybe you should have um, some before school time, some after school time? Maybe there's a lab that. And I don't know, it's different for every building, but maybe you can keep a lab open for an hour after school and it's because there's a staff member who's there or because, you know, somebody's going to monitor that. And students are, are aware you can stay after school for an hour or you can show up an hour early. We're here anyway. You are allowed to come in an hour early and use the lab. It may, you may need to make some adjustments like that. Or you might need to do a private survey among your kids to find out who doesn't have access and make sure that they get some priority access in school. That if you have class time, make sure that child can get down to the library or get access to the computers you do have. Um, and of course, there are programs that's maybe different, different parts of the state, different parts of the country, where they can have uh, low-cost computers or low-cost connectivity uh, for students who are in need. So there are other things you need to look at. But yes, that is definitely an issue that has to be addressed. Any other questions, either on this or anything in general? Yes. Um, which one would that be? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, uh, my information again, uh, the apps user group site is just apps usergroup.org and my podcast is thestateoftech.org and then uh, on the one before that I think is my email which is just erickurtz at gmail.com but you can also just go to erickurtz.com and there's links to everything anything I have any connection to erickurtz.com I use it's just a little splash page with links out to apps user group and this and that and whatever so any of those you know th that will get you to where you need to let me know if you have questions very excited to see what you guys end up developing and doing love to learn from you guys as well as you roll all this out